What is up guys? Today we're going to be looking at disorders of vertigo and specifically looking at the peripheral vertigo, uh, vertigo disorder. So there's two subclasses that we'll get into central and peripheral and we'll talk a little bit about what vertigo is, how to distinguish whether they're central or peripheral, and then look at the various types of peripheral vertigo and kind of uh, be able to distinguish between uh, the different types. So let's get right into this. So what is vertigo? So this is just a feeling of spinning or rotating. Now vertigo is di is different than saying that you are lightheaded or that you're weak. This feeling of like the world is spinning and that you're seeing that through your eyes is specifically vertigo. So this is not dizziness per se and this is not lightheadedness. This is something a little different. So there's two types. So there's peripheral or central. Peripheral or central. So this is the first thing we have to talk about, the dix hall pike maneuver. So in this maneuver, a neurologist or a doctor or whatever will lay will start with the patient sitting up on the exam bed, and then he will lay the patient back with their neck turned to the specific side that he's trying to like analyze for that specific test. So say the patient's head is going to be turned to the right, you're going to lay the patient backwards, and then you're going to extend the patient's head over the end of the exam bed and let it kind of rest backwards while the head is turned. Then you're going to look, watch the patient and look for any sort of nystagmus that happens in the eye. So to be able to distinguish between peripheral or central, if the nystagmus doesn't happen as much when you repeat the test, so usually you do the test uh, like three times or so, and uh, for each side, and if if after the if you're doing the you know after the first test you see nystagmus, and then the second test you you see nystagmus but it's not as much, and then in the third test it just seems it doesn't happen anymore. This is a sign of a peripheral uh, vertigo, or a cause is going to be peripheral, which we'll talk about those. That's kind of the focus of this video. Now, if there is an immediate response, in other words. If the vertigo happens right when you put them in that position, there is kind of no building up or no pause before it, or if the nystagmus is vertical, because most of the time you'll see horizontal or turning, but if it's vertical, if it has an immediate response, or if there's no fatigue, if you can just keep doing it three, four, five times, and then it just keeps happening, it doesn't seem to be dying down, this, these are all signs of a central vertigo. So we're going to focus on peripheral vertigo. So here they are. Here are the start of the peripheral vertigo disorders. I kept them really straightforward and simple, so I just wrote the cause and then the signs, and this is going to help you to distinguish between these different types on a test. So for they mostly test about peripheral vertigo. So another thing to note is peripheral vertigo is vertig causes of vertigo or disorders of vertigo that happen in your, basically relating to your ear, your inner ear or you could say a combination of uh, middle to inner ear. And then central vertigo is, is relating to your brain stem, or you could say even up into the upper part of your spinal cord. So those are those type of causes. So And that kind of makes sense. At the periphery of your body are the ears, and then at the central part of your body is your spinal cord and your brain stem, and that's, that's kind of easy to remember. So the majority of questions come from peripheral vertigo disorders. So the first one is many ears disease. The cause of this is just increased endolymph pressure of the ear, and these are the three things that you're going to see, and these three, thring, these three things, these signs, are going to show up in a lot of these. But I'm going to explain later why some of these ones don't show up in some of the other ones, and it's really straightforward once you understand it. So you're going to see in this disease, because of this increased endolymph pressure of the ear, you're going to see tinnitus, hearing loss. So remember, tinnitus is just like a ringing in the ears. And that, that symptom is related to the vestibular cochlear, which all of these are the vestibular cochlear. But there are two branches of this, the uh, vestibular cochlear. There is a cochlear branch, which is related to hearing. So obviously the ringing in the ears is something you hear, so that's related to a problem with the cochlear branch being interfered with. Hearing loss is related to the cochlear branch. And then vertigo um, is related to the vestibular branch. Remember, vertigo is that spinning sensation. So the vestibular is kind of like your ability to orient yourselves and to kind of stay balanced and to be able to see everything straightforward and not be all off. So that is the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. Something to keep in mind, you will patients will usually have had this for a long time, like years. So this isn't something that just comes and goes like an infection or an inflammation. This is a disorder that you usually have for a long time, many years disease. Okay, the next one is acoustic neuroma. And another name for this is vestibular swanoma. So because it is a swanoma or a tumor of the swan cells 
at basically on the vestibular cochlear nerve. So what are the what are going to be the signs? What's well, going to be the same thing? It's still affecting the um, co vestibular cochlear of the entire part. So it's going to be all the symptoms of many air. So you're going to have tinnitus, hearing loss, and vertigo like we just talked about. But you could also have a possible change in taste, facial numbness, or pain. And that is because of the other nerves that could be affected like the trigeminal, um, etc. And also, you have to keep in mind that acoustic neuromas, or another name you'll hear is, like I said, vestibular schwannomas, they have an association with neurofibromatosis type 2. Neurofibromatosis type 2. If you don't remember the stuff that happens in that, I have a really good video describing the difference between neurofibromatosis 1 and 2 using clever mnemonics. So check that video out. I will pin that at the bottom of this video in the comments. Um, this one though, how you can distinguish this, not only from all the other symptoms, is that notice that this one gets progressively worse. Now this intuitively should make sense. A tumor that is growing or is developing will begin to impinge on nerves in the surrounding tissue more and more as it gets bigger and bigger. So naturally the symptoms of um, tinnitus, hearing loss, and vertigo will get progressively worse along with whatever else symptoms it may have, whether it's a change in taste, facial numbness and pain, etc. And then and it's constant vertigo, whereas you'll see that many ears disease will come and go, um, usually over the course of minutes to, let's say, even hours. Uh, this is constant vertigo as the tumor grows. So it gets progressively worse, and it's kind of a constant vertigo that you deal with all the time. So that is acoustic neuroma. The next one is labyrinthitis. This is inflammation of the inner ear, vestibular cochlear nerve, both branches. Now, I'm saying that because look at the disorder down here. Look at the difference of labyrinthitis versus vestibular neuritis. Vestibular neuritis is inflammation of the inner ear, vestibular cochlear nerve. Same exact thing as a labyrinthitis, except it's only the vestibular branch. Now, you can already imagine some of the differences in the symptoms between these two. In labyrinthitis, if it's hitting the entire vestibular cochlear nerve, both branches, that's the vestibular and the cochlear, you're going to have all the same symptoms that we had with many ears disease and the other disease. You're going to have tinnitus. Why? The ringing in the ears because you're hitting the cochlear branch. You're going to have hearing loss. Why? Because you're hitting the cochlear branch. Those are both, those are the branch involved with hearing. And vertigo and that kind of inability to orient yourself in the spinning is because of the vestibular branch. And you're hitting all of of these in labyrinthitis, whereas vestibular neuritis, you're only hitting the vestibular branch. That's kind of easy to remember. It starts with vestibular. And also notice that this is vertigo only, which I said, but this is usually post-viral infection. I've seen this in a lot of questions. They'll say that the patient had some sort of viral infection a few weeks back, and now all of a sudden they're dealing with vertigo and that's their only symptom. Um, you need to be thinking of vestibular neuritis, okay? The next one is benign proxismal positional vertigo, sometimes it's just BPPV. This is due to a calcium debris that builds up in the semicircular canals. Just look at the name, okay? If you're trying to figure out what happened to this, just look at the title. Benign paroxysmal, so that means it comes and goes, positional vertigo. So there it's telling you that's all they're going to deal with is vertigo, and it's positional, they're telling you that, and it comes and goes. So what happens? As you change position, say from laying down to sitting up, or from looking right to looking left, or do doing something, some sort of movement from sitting still to moving, this vertigo will then begin to happen. Now this only lasts a few seconds because as you make the movement and then let's say you're now in that new position, you stop moving, then it can then go away once you get, once your body, once that calcium debris begins to settle back to its uh, position again in your body then gets oriented again. So this is a vertigo related to position changes that last only a few seconds. Now remember many airs disease lasted um, from minutes to hours and then if we go back if you look at acoustic neuroma I said that this one is the one that is just constant all the time so little things like that can help you to get these as well the next one is going to be perilymphatic fistula this is a fistula that forms so a fistula is just an opening between two places that aren't normally connected so this is going to be a connection that shouldn't be there so there's a connection that forms between the middle and the inner ear from trauma okay so any type of trauma you can imagine you're going to present in this one, you're going to have tinnitus, hearing loss, and vertigo, naturally, because you've literally had it put a hole between the middle and the inner ear, and that's going to set all this stuff, this stuff off, um, especially with the fluid changes that happen from that fistula, and you could begin to mess up the vestibular cochlear nerve by impingement and whatnot. But this happens only when you sneeze, strain, or hear loud noises. This makes sense. If you have a fistula between the middle and the inner ear, say this is the tympanic membrane, we're at the middle ear and then so this is middle ear and this over here is inner ear this is just I know this isn't accurate I'm just a quick little drawing and there's a hole here where fluid can come in and go back out the other way naturally when you sneeze pressure builds up and then fluid will then go 
from inside to outside or outside to inside depending on what kind of pressure is going on. So if you sneeze, if you strain, or even if you hear loud noises, remember when you hear really loud noises, the, um, the three tiny bones in your ear can begin to vibrate and they kind of all work together and that can cause a lot of pressure changes as well. So this is tinnitus, hearing loss, and vertigo, but it only happens when you basically strain yourself via sneezing, straining, any sort of straining or hearing loud noises. So that is perilymphatic fistula. Alright, so that's the end of these videos, uh, I'm sorry, these disorders, and I will see you in another video. Bye guys.